Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How are you? This is your host, Garfield Waller, and you are on Rock the Mic. Well, it was a very warm day here in Central Florida, and thank God, a little rain just started. I just heard it pattering on the window panes. Uh, today, it started out on a somber note. Today, my mom would have been 90, wishing her a very happy heavenly birthday, and for all the people who wrote in on Facebook and called in, thank you very much. If you have lost a mom or a dear one of late, condolences to you. And just remember, they'll always be with you. They'll always be with you. So guys, let's get on with the program. Just had news earlier today about that earth tremor in St. Thomas. I think the center was near St. Thomas. Uh, I don't know if much damage was done, but I hope all everybody was safe. I can see Mr. Newell waiting in the green room there. He is going to be coming on shortly. He will be on shortly. So, ladies and gentlemen, in keeping with the interviews I've been doing, so far we have been interviewing a group of aspiring politicians. We started off with Giovanni Byfield, then we went to Mr. Basco, and then we had Floyd Morris on last week. And this week we round out the quartet with very eloquent young man. You are going to be so enthralled to hear him. So these gentlemen are up for Western St. Mary and Central St. Mary to represent the constituents for the PNP. And the gentleman we have tonight, he'll be representing or trying to become the next MP for Central St. Mary. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to you Omar Newell. Hi, Mr. Newell. Glad you could make it, sir. Good evening, Garfield. Um, <laughs> thank you for having me. I just I just got off one of the walks we had in an area in Highgate, Capture Land. Capture. Oh I'm yeah. Now, yep. <laughs> I'm now in, in Sunside. Um, wow. As I indicated to you, I didn't get a chance to go back home to pick up my microphone. Go back home. Yeah. Hearing me clearly. Yeah, man. Loud and clear. So are you at one of your constituents' houses or what? I am. <laughs> I'm at one of my team members' homes. Oh, in, good, uh, good, good, good. In Sunside. Glad you could glad you could make it, man. We didn't want uh, to disappoint. We didn't want to make it. <laughs> so uh -huh. here we are. Yeah, man. I'm glad I'm glad you could. And anyway, guys, if you're out there listening, just put something in the chat for me to make me know whether it's too high, too low, or whatever. So Omar, glad to finally put a face to the name. <laughs> I've heard so I've heard so much about you, sir. Great. And we hope we can get into some of this today. So, Omar, let me ask you. Like I asked Floyd last week, one word to describe Omar. One word. Energetic. Energetic. Give me another one. Calm. Calm. And I know, okay. I know, I know both sound my my. Sound yes, yes. Mutually <laughs> exclusive, but I bring a lot of energy. I bring a lot of uh -huh. calm, calmness, and deliberation to anything I do, nonetheless. To anything you do, okay. Now, Omar, can you tell us a little bit about? The early days of Omar Newell. What was it like? Where are you from? All right. So I was born at the Port Maria Hospital. And I grew up primarily between Highgate, between Islington and Highgate. Islington is where I was taken home to as a child. And perhaps this is an opportunity to address the banter that my, my, my friend, my good friend made last week about <laughs> my transfer. <laughs> So let, let me tell you, <laughs> some time ago, my aunt did an interview on CVM mm. television, and she, she stated the reality that she felt that I wouldn't amount to much. And her reason oh, for yeah. that is my mother had to move around quite a bit. Um, uh -huh. So I went to three different basic schools. I went to City Mission Basic School in Islington, Highgate Basic School, and I went to Draper's Basic School in Portland. Wow. Um, in terms of primary schools, I went to... Water Valley Primary. I went to Long Road Primary, but I substantially wow. went to Highgate All Age and Junior High in Highgate. And in terms of high school, I went to both St. Mary High School and Kitsch. No, you should have stopped. No, you should have stopped right there. You should have stopped right at St. Mary. But, but let me tell you. <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> and 
the thing is, I've grown and learned to laugh about the circumstance that would have caused this moving around. But my mother was yeah. in an abusive relationship. Okay, I understand. And mm-hmm. by the time I was in high school, um, she started, and in, it's in retrospect that you realize she started to put things in place in to Mexico. really run away. Um, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Because it was either her life or, you know, I have, I have three other siblings by my mother. They mm-hmm. all share the same father. I did not. So when she was looking to run away, a major concern of hers was whether any of the abuse would have been meted to me. To and so okay. what she did, she conspired with my dad and my grandmother in Portland and had me transferred. Now, you know, as a 13-year-old who I would have been um, going into third form, I never had much of a say in that. In fact, the, the say I had in, I really wanted to stand up for my mom. But, you know, it was an abusive situation. She ran away. She was, we found her in Clarendon later on, a couple of years later when I finished fifth form. Um, but I still identify as, while I identify as a Titchfield graduate, I'm still an old boy of St. Mary High School, and I've still worked with that institution. And my class year, I'm still very closely connected to them, even though I didn't see it through until the end of fifth form. Okay, well, we'll forgive you for that, all right? <laughs> okay, so Omar, when did the young Omar get involved in, in politics? I actually didn't, so my grandmother, uh, well, let's start with my grandfather. My grandfather, he is Sergeant Vassal. Um, he used to be the foreman of the Whitehall estate in, you know, okay. Whitehall. He lived in Com City. Yeah, yeah. A All lot right. of people mm-hmm. from Harmony Hall will tell you, especially people who are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, that the first youth group they went to was down at, youth PNP group they went to was down by Sergeant's house. My mother okay. was always involved, and but because of the circumstances of my growing up, she felt that I had the ability, and so I should focus on my school and on education. So I never came up through the YO. Um, I voted, but I wasn't involved. My first involvement in politics really came on campus in the United States. Um, when a young senator by the name of Barack Obama was going to run. And though I was not a U.S. citizen, though I wasn't a citizen of the U.S., I was inspired by that campaign and became a part of a group called Young Lawyers and Law Students for Obama. And, you know, my limited involvement on that campaign resulted in me um, being one of the invitees to his victory speech in Chicago. I was in law school in Chicago Uh by the time he won. And I, I did the outside broadcast on behalf of Nationwide because they realized I had been invited and I had a friend who was a, a co-host on Nationwide. So I brought the play-by-play from, um, I think, Lincoln Park, it was in Chicago, okay. for Nationwide and for Jamaica. Um, I, I, started I, writing that around that, mm-hmm. I started writing around that period. And so I wrote a number of articles on things such as education and the need for additional testing in terms of numeracy. Um, in terms of what kind of challenges young people may have and how we could assist them better. Um, And, you know, I started writing on innovation, a couple other things during that period. Um, In 2007, when former Prime Minister Portia Simpson Miller, when we lost that election under her leadership, I decided to create a Facebook page for her. And that got me some attention from her office. I remember her calling me one morning when I was heading to class and telling, telling, inviting me to a meeting at OLO. And I had to tell her that I was in Chicago going to class. And she okay. was surprised. Yeah. That, that page, they still operate now. Uh-huh. Um, I joined an organization in New York called the Jamaica National Movement. And Maurice Guy and uh, Lisa Hanna both vouched for my direct membership application to the PNP around that time uh, in 2007. And there started my active involvement as a member, as opposed to just a supporter of the PNP. So your active membership started around 2007? Correct. And you've, you've been back in the island since 2007? No, I moved back no. home fully in 2012. But in oh, either 2007 or 2008, um, former 
comrade leader Simpson Miller introduced me to a gentleman by the name of Raymond Price and encouraged me to join an organization called the Patriots. And oh. so I established a relatively short-lived chapter in New York of the Patriots. And, um, but that is where my involvement started. But I moved home fully in 2012. I visited to campaign in 2011. But in terms of uh -huh. completing school and moving home for good, that was 2012. 2012. Wow. Extensive, because I'm looking at I'm looking at your poster here, and let me see if I can just share this on the screen. And it's very extensive. Your 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 resume here is very extensive. Let me see if I can just share this. Um, okay, it should be coming up here. Okay, for those who can see this, bright looking young man, BBA management, Monroe College, New York, Juris Doctor. Northwestern University School of Law, and it outlines your extensive political service. Yeah. Very extensive. Very impressive, sir. Very, very, very impressive. But what's the, what is the Newell family like? How many? Just um, your loan or what? <laughs> in terms of my immediate family? Yes. Uh -huh. So my, my wife, um, okay. Dr. Nardia Thompson Newell, she is mm -hmm. uh, a medical doctor and emergency room specialist. Um, mm -hmm. Substantively, she works at the University of the West Indies, but now she's doing a fellowship at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto and the University okay. of Toronto. So when she completes, um, she will be the only pediatric emergency, well, the second pediatric emergency medicine doctor in pediatric emergency medicine doctor in Jamaica. Um, she's okay. also doing a fellowship in simulation, which will revolutionize how medical students are trained and limit, mm -hmm. and limit the amount of exposure they have to get to live um, patients and situations in hospital. Um, we have an eight-year-old son. Okay, I received okay. his report. I received his report today. And so I, I will have to treat him tomorrow and going into the week because <laughs> his average is in the 90s. Yeah. Um, yeah, some will say yes. he's taking from his mother what he's doing oh, oh, never he's doing <laughs> yes some of us parents make some promises sometimes and then when it's time, time for the kids to cash out we're in trouble <laughs> Sorry. yes sir so I, as a young man but, starting over so, the sorry, I, I, yeah, go ahead. I can't I can't complete mentioning family before without mentioning my mother um, okay. her name mm -hmm. is Ione Vassal people call her Marcia she started the first cosmetology school in Highgate um, behind what you might know as Miss Graham. There's a plaza there now. Okay. Um, she, she also taught cosmet cosmetology at Horace Clark High School for a short while. That's a school that I chair. And mm -hmm. she operated a container when she moved back to St. Mary where she sold a number of commodities, inclu including farm produce um, uh -huh. for residents of the community of uh islington now she's extremely popular in highgate and islington so i'll just mention her nurse mori iris mori uh who is the former head of the midwives association of jamaica she's my aunt even though if you ask her she'll tell you she's my i am her son but she's my <laughs> aunt um the lakeman family from sport road they're my relatives so the 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 lakeman family i'm told we have some relatives in cox street port Mary as well um, okay. going around and meeting the, some members of the extended family. Okay, so a young man like you, a young man like you, why get that involved in politics? Normally in Jamaica, a politician is 60s, 70s. Why is it a guy like you just born back in independence, as they would say, yeah. jump so wholeheartedly into politics? Well, a number of things, a number of things. Um, one, I... You, you know, the PNP has a youth organization, so it's not uncommon for young people to join um, this political party. I'm the former president of the Patriots. And having been around politics for a while, I, I, and having had to do a lot of social intervention um, in and across my parish, and in Portland and in Kingston, other parts, um, Damien Crawford had a saying that I heard a number of years ago where he said, when you're doing your one one thing, um, you know you, your impact is limited. Politics is kind of like a bus; you can carry more people forward than you would in a car, as the one one helping would be. 
Um, I think this country needs serious transformation. And I think we need a mix. I think everybody needs to be represented in parliament. I think the young need to be represented. I think the old need to be represented. Um, when you look at the voters list in Jamaica, about 49% of voters are 39 years old and younger. And most, when Michael Manley went in, he had such strong support from young people that he was confident in advocating, well, in moving the voting age from 21 to 18. 18. And that's because when you're new going in and people can identify with you and feel they can relate, then they're, they're inclined to jump on your wagon and support you. Um, I think, it, you know, we have, been, we have been accused from time to time of skipping a generation or two. I think if we're going to bring in that demographic, that 49% of the voting population that are largely under-engaged, then we need some people who sound, who look like them, and who they look up to for leadership going in. We did a poll in this constituency, and usually when a politician is going in, any politician is going into a constituency, when you look at a poll, people tend to vote along just party line. Well, the same obtains in Central St. Mary, except when you look at the poll in terms of the number that the candidate would move, my numbers was four times that of my, 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 fellow, um, my fellow comrade. And I think a lot of that has to do with the views of the younger voters. Um, and but, I relate very well with the mm -hmm. senior voters as well. With the senior voters. So Let me ask you something. Do you think part of the shift could be due to the fact that some of these older guys are stuck in the past, unwilling think, to change your ways. What do you think? I think there is some of that. Um, I think after being in, in legislation, uh, being a legislator for, let's say, 20 or 25 years, you probably get stuck in a, a kind of groupthink. Um, but, you know, I, I think the electorate is craving fresh both face and ideas the mm. craving fresh image the craving fresh ideas oh good point and just to sidestep i'm looking in the chat and already i see i get myself in trouble with <laughs> henry b he's an old teacher man yes. <laughs> nothing to Nothing to be apologetic about. Yes, Henry, we just, I'm just making fun. So I know Teachfield is I'm, I'm supposed to be this beacon. As I went to <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this man can bring some fire when he's ready. Another thing I always wanted to find out. Do you honestly believe, I don't know where you are domiciled at the moment, whether you're in St. Mary or in Kingston, but do you honestly believe that a politician can give his all to a constituency in which he doesn't live? Well, a, what do you think? A, a member of parliament has dual roles. Mm -hmm. um, there's the role as the representative who will look to bring a development agenda and move it forward for the people of the constituency. But there's also a national role, which is that of a, of a legislator that mm -hmm. will move the kinds of legislation in parliament that can drive the country, the bigger picture forward. I, I reside both in Kingston and St. Mary. And yeah, if you okay. go to the UK, if you go to uh, the United States, um, you will find that a lot of people who operate in similar roles to the one I'm vying for, they mm -hmm. maintain residence in both the capital and in the area that they serve. The so they serve. I think you have, to, you have to look at it with that duality in mind. I'm in St. Mary the majority of people don't even know that i sometimes sleep in kingston because i'm in st mary um three four five time days per week, a week um okay. mm -hmm. you know all right with omar newell every politician every politician really has has to have some sort of ego because to go in and say hey i can do this I, you need an ego for that but do you like to win or is it that you hate to lose if you were to describe yourself, do you like winning or you hate losing? Which is it? I, I'm very competitive. Um, I, I, I work, I've worked very hard in any role that I've been in. I played mm -hmm. soccer for Monroe, well, football. I played football for Monroe College. And even though I spent more time on the bench than on the field, whenever I was on the field, I gave it my <laughs> all. Um, I, 
I was captain of the debating team when I was at Monroe. And we, we participated in the Lincoln Douglas debate, um, debates. Mm -hmm. And winning was, you know, anything I go in, I go in to win. And there's mm -hmm. a sweet, there's a joy that comes with winning. But what is what brings even more joy is when you can go into something and ensure a win-win, not just for you, but for everybody else. Um, you know, those cheering you on and you know, everybody else. And politics brings that opportunity for a win-win. All right. So you are contesting this seat with versus uh Floyd Morris. Yeah. No, it's basically if and when the general election is called, this is gonna be basically a safe seat, right? PNP safe seat. Now, coming in like this, do you think you're at a disadvantage to Floyd, who is way up in the PNP echelon? Or um, do you think well, you're... All right, go ahead. Well, let's talk about what that means. So first of all, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm one of those politicians who believe no seat is safe. Um, you could argue that Western Westmoreland was a safe PNP seat yeah. until the last election. <laughs> Last As was Central yeah. Westmoreland, East Portland was pretty safe. Um, if you if if you if you look at the structure of the PNP though and how it is organized, the the basic structure is a party group. I'm a member of a party group. The highest decision making body is the annual conference. I'm a delegate to mm -hmm. the annual conference. Okay. The the body that makes decisions outside of annual conference is the National Executive Council. I'm a member. And the body that makes decisions week to week is the executive committee, of which I am also a member. I have been asked to run for office in the party before. I have always said, though, that I wanted to focus on my business um, because I had uh, received some indication that the member of parliament would not be going forward. And I felt it was important to put certain structures in place so okay, that okay. I could give time um, to both a campaign and to representing the people of Central St. Mary. But I think if we speak about the higher echelons of the party, I am well supported. Mm -hmm. Now, when you speak about the, the, the constituency, uh -huh. um, I am one of the three, and rest in peace um, to Councillor Dixon, who would have been the fourth mm -hmm. vice chairman. But I am one of the three vice chairs for the constituency. The other two vice chairmen are Comrade Everton Garvey, who is my campaign manager, and Comrade Paul Fife, who is my Highgate, uh, my manager for the Highgate division. Um, in terms of that, the, the leadership of the constituency, I have the majority support. And in terms of the electorate, based on the, the polls that have been done to date, I am also leading. So I think the echelons, the higher echelons, to use your word of the party, want Central St. Mary to remain a strong seat. And so I expect that um, there will be no disadvantage to me because we both want the same thing. Well, as you say, Jimmy, could this one going below? Hell on powder house. Because <laughs> both of you seem like you have, you know, good back in there. But let's get into the meat of the matter now, Omar. Central St. Mary, what does the area need? And what would you bring to the table? What would you well, bring to the people? The first thing I think it needs is a facilitatory leader. Um, I don't know if you read on community organizing and Saul Alinsky, who they had demonized Obama because he was a, an ardent reader of Alinsky's um, views on community organizing. But one of the things Saul Alinsky says, which I hold true, is that the regular people in the communities even though they might not be able to articulate in a way that when they make a phone call, the president of a company will jump on the, on the phone, they tend to have a good idea of what their communities need. So the first thing I will bring is a facilitatory approach to leadership. Now, I have some ideas that I will come with, but I don't come with all ideas. And so we have been going into communities and listening. So I went to Capture Land today, um, prepared to talk about agriculture because I know there were some farming families there. And the issue they had, they don't have title to the land and they don't have um, consistent running water. Those are those, is those, those are their issues. Those are things I will have to put on my agenda as their representative. Let us talk about though, in terms of my plans, because I don't think mm -hmm. anybody should run for office without having plans. Having plans. Um, mm -hmm. I have done some assessments of the constituency and we are still 
even though education is one of the largest employers in the constituency. And when I say education, I mean in almost every community you go in Central St. Mary, the school is the largest employer. Yep. Even, though, even though that is so, agriculture is still a major employer. You may not have, still have the Highgate Chocolate Factory that is doing the food processing. My aunt works there. Um, and you may not have the banana chips factory that I'm told was um, in Islington, probably still is. But agriculture is still a major employer. Um, and I intend to support agriculture as it exists, but I also intend to bring in some new things. I'll give you an example. I'm the largest importer of tilapia feed. Tilapia is so our coast, our, our sea, um, sea fish, and fisher folk, when you go to them, they will tell you that their catch is getting smaller and smaller, and smaller by the day. Mm -hmm. Inland fishing has taken off in St. Catherine and Clarendon. I'm the largest distributor of fish feed to inland farmers, the largest. Um, I recently passed Hypro, and I'm now the largest distributor. Um, we have a lot of vendors who travel from St. Mary, who travel from St. Anne, who travel from Portland, and go into Clarendon and St. Catherine to buy, to buy fish, and mm -hmm. the farmers there cannot adequately supply them. What I've done, there's a gentleman in Highgate who owns 130 acres with a waterfall and river water flowing through by the name of Davis. I had a conversation with him. I worked with him to bring in to bring in fisheries to go and test the soil. It has very good clay soil. And I want to get them to come to other parts of St. Mary and test the soil to see if we have good clay where we can develop an industry that not only supplies the local demand for whole fish, but mm -hmm. also does <clears throat> clay so that we don't have to continue importing tilapia filet to see how we can supply some of the hotels on the coast because the road network that we have makes us makes it very convenient for us to load a truck or a van with fish filet and send it down to Montego Bay and send it down to Negril and send it down to Ocherios and supply uh, those hotels. So that's one. The second thing is I purchased a housing demand survey from NHD, and you may note a trend. I like to do a little research before I, 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 I discuss. Um, Highgate and Port Maria are two of the places that are in high demand for housing in St. Mary. Central St. Mary is, is ripe for a construction boom. I brought in a contractor. He's based in Montego Bay, just a friend of mine, to have a, an exploratory mm -hmm. conversation. And he said, he agrees with me that based on where Port Mary is located and where Highgate is located, just the fact that transportation is so convenient between both towns. If you live in Port Mary, it's easy to get to Highgate. It's easy to get, sorry, if you live in Islington, it's easy to get to Highgate. It's easy to get to Port Mary. If you live in Geisel, if you live in almost anywhere in St. Mary, it's convenient. And out of that, he has started talking to some landowners to see how he can partner to do some housing construction because construction is a major issue. Another concern I observed within the constituency is a lot of the areas are not properly lit and that presents a risk for people living in those communities. Um, crime doesn't like light. Crime <laughs> thrives on darkness. And I started a project where we have been getting solar street lamps and going around to places in the constituency. I have five in my van trunk now as we speak, and we're installing those in communities. Now we put up a street lamp on a, a place in Port Maria and the rest of the residents called me and said, listen, Mr. Newell, I want to know what you paid for it because this transformed the area so much that we want to put in two more, but we want to put the money together to get it. We don't okay. want to call on you and pressure you to get them two lamps. Sports is another area that has my attention and will continue to have it. I'm, the, I'm a sponsor of both Albion Mountain Football Club, um, which is the only National League football team in St. Mary, and the Highgate United Football Club, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which plays in, the, in, 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 a, in a parish league. Now, I recently helped with some fundraising to do a small development at Clemards Park so that we can host National Leagues there. But I want to do a bigger thing with Clemards Park, Garfield. Mm -hmm. You live in the United States, so you know the idea of 
providing naming rights for sports facilities. True, true. Mm-hmm. I think I think as a member as member of parliament, one of the things I intend to do is to partner with a private sector company and you know go through the necessary rules in terms of how you get it done. I know the park is managed by the parish council, so we'll have to partner with them. But I want to go to a private sector entity and say, listen, we will give you a five-year naming right if you invest this one-time amount and if you put X within the park over a five-year period to ensure the sustainability of the park. And that is how we're going to get Clemards Park to become the kind of facility that can accommodate any dream that our football teams may have. So if they want to go to Premier League, which requires a minimum of 500 seats in a stand. In a stand, mm-hmm. we want to ensure that Clemards Park can accommodate that. Education is another area of focus for me. Um, I, I was guest speaker at the Highgate Primary graduation a few years ago. And I went up to St. Mary High School to talk to my form teacher for grade 7 because Highgate Primary is a major feeder school into St. Mary High School. Yep. And, you know, when we spoke... The impression I got was that the Highgate Primary School students were going in with very good test results, as you would expect. But there are certain fundamentals that they would expect that the students are not necessarily going into grade 7 with. You know the idea of a school district. We have school chairmen across the constituency. I want want to see how we can create better linkages between the feeder schools Mm -hmm. and whether, whether it's the basic school to primary school level or the primary school to high school level. So that there is a smooth transition. So when a, so a, a grade six teacher knows exactly not only how to prepare a student to do well in PEP, but knows exactly what a student needs to know when they go into grade seven. So that there can be a smoother transition. Also, okay. students can mm-hmm. learn on, on hungry belly. When I was at St. Mary High, because I grew up in a one-bedroom house, five of us on one bed. I have a virgin who was, I know a a past student who is now a good friend of mine by the name of Christopher Burns. I found out that Christopher Burns, when he was writing for the uh, Jamaica Observer, he was contributing all of his pay from that endeavor to the guidance counseling department at St. Mary High School to ensure that I could have a patty and cocoa bread for lunch. Yep. I want to know how we can transform Mm -hmm. the school feeding program so that the pit of them who people feel say now nah, learn because them head tough so that they can have proper nutrition and we say you know you know garfield that in some school districts in the u.s the only strong solid reliable meal that some kids can depend on is what they get in school well, they get in the school, school canteen mm-hmm. so we want to see how we can rely um <clears throat> on both the resources available in the diaspora and let me just touch two more things healthcare yeah man go, go ahead man. I this is yours. my <laughs> wife is a doctor I want to see, some time ago I learned that there are lots of plants. So when me look a bit on the liver sent me, if my belly hurt me, my grandmother know which plant for tear down. Which plant for the I'm boiler. Making, <laughs> if my head hurting me, she know the same thing. But I don't think we have invested enough in research and development in those plants. There are few people um, who have done it and have done well working on things like the, what I'm calling the old man's beard and a few other things. Yep. But I feel we need to bring some of that into St. Mary's, see how we can do some research on some of these plants and what kind of nutraceuticals and pharmaceuticals we can come up with. A good yeah, friend of mine just mm-hmm. partnered with Cuba and he's doing some things where pharmaceuticals are concerned. Let us see how we can go to the higher value things, not just the distribution of stuff, but how we can go into research and development and innovations so that we can drive generations of Jamaicans for, of Jamaicans forward. Oh, I mean? have been raised, I've been doing some things on a small scale. I recently did a contribution to the St. Mary Health Department with the help of people in the diaspora of uh, certain equipment, surgical gowns, a number of things um, to see how we can make, make we things can. a little bit easier for them. Social housing is the last that I want to touch on. And there are many more, but I don't many want more. to dominate mm-hmm. the conversation with just <laughs> No, man, go ahead. I want, go ahead, man. <laughs> I want to partner with the diaspora to form the Central St. Mary Trust because government doesn't have the resources to do everything the constituency needs. Right. Mm-hmm. I have helped a number of people with building their houses in Central St. Mary. And a lot of times it's really, you know, low income thing. You're helping to put up some plywood and you wonder what will happen to that structure in another three to five years. 
But there are lots of good people in the diaspora who are helping out with things locally. And I want to see how we can work with them to put a structured program in place to focus on education, to focus on healthcare, and to focus on social housing so that we can, we can help to bring some dignity and transform generations in central mm -hmm. St. Mary. Now, the, the things like road and water um, that members of parliament are expected to deal with, we'll continue to deal mm -hmm. with those. But these are some of the transformational things. Because when you start bringing in more income into central St. Mary, um, then you can make a bigger argument that this is what we're contributing to the national, to the nation in terms of taxation. Why is it more tax dollars being invested in bringing better infrastructure to the, to the people of central St. Mary? So those are some of the programs that I intend to put in place. Um, there are more I will share over time. And I will also bring a robust agenda in terms of advocacy um, for the constituency and the constituents of Central St. Mary. All right. Mr. Newell, I, you, when you mentioned Capturland and those yes. people who have no title, what can be done? Is there anything that can be done to get them on a legal footing? Well, I think there are a number of things that can be done. I mean, government makes government makes laws. So whatever the impediments, um, and of course, a proper assessment will need to be done in terms of the specific impediments. I spent a few months as a consultant on the National Land Titling Program. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, Garfield, they're one of the major um, surprises that I went in and found was that there, about, there were about 50,000 titles locked up in a vault that, you know, people owe uh, like fifteen or $20,000 on a piece of land. And mm -hmm. you've been trying to communicate with a person who um, died 20 years ago and you're not able to communicate <laughs> with them. And because you're a slave to whatever laws that are on the books, you can't move the process forward. But we need to find a way to um bypass some of the archaic laws pro probably in a in a responsible way that ensures because there are certain issues that can come when you're simplifying things in terms of titling um you know you don't want to open the, the door for people to come in for charlatans to come in and try and thief mm -hmm. people land that they should rightfully own but we definitely have to look at going take a look at some of the impediments and that is my approach to things that's my approach to the projects that i say um, I would want to see go forward in Central St. Mary, and that's just my approach to life. First, you go in, you do a proper review of what the impediments are, and then you develop a program that can address um, those impediments. All right. Another big, another big thing that some of the people uh, want me to ask you. Over the years, growing up, Portmore Hospital was one of the premier health centers. Do you have any plans to revitalize that thing? So healthcare is a major part of my platform. And hold on. And I, I expect, yeah, I was born in Anatomy Hospital, yes. and I really want to see Anatomy and Portmore, Portmore back up top. And, Should not and to send you know, to St. Anne's. <laughs> and, and having been born in the Portmore Hospital, you know that I, 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 I'm, even, I'm even more moved to want to see that hospital transformed. Um, I... I think a lot can be done. I think the first thing we need to do is we need to take a look at the infrastructure leading up to the hospital. Um, we need to ensure that it is, it is appropriate for the kinds of emergencies um, that that road will need to accommodate. Um, you know, it, it, it is not going to be something that a constituency development fund alone will be able to do. It is going to require linkages with both both the works ministry in terms of uh, that main road, that, that road that leads up, and with the Ministry of Health, the Minister of Health, um, in terms of the transformation of the facilities, facilities there. But make no mistake about it, the capital of St. Mary remains Port Maria. And I believe the parish capital needs to have a, a, hospital, a facility that is fitting of a parish capital. And so I am committed to doing the advocacy work, the hard work that is necessary to ensure that I'm in the ears of the minister um, until we have that hospital transformed. Or when I, when I get home, my personal minister of health will be in my ears 
advocating. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I hope she does. <laughs> and another thing with another thing with Port Maria, this constant problem we've been having, flooding. Yes. Do you have any ideas of, you know, have you ever brought in or do you plan to bring any contractors or developers to see what can be done? Because Port Maria, as it is, is caught between two hills and two rivers. Yes. What do you think we can do to alleviate that flooding problem? Well, I, I so, so here's, here's my view on Port Murray, which I've expressed um, over and over in, in, many, in many spaces. So first, let me, let me just start off by saying I have no background in engineering apart from trying to assemble some toys with my <laughs> eight-year-old. Um, but if, if human advancement has come so far that we're building islands on water, in Dubai and other places, I cannot be convinced that there isn't an engineering solution for Port Murray. I've heard conversations about what the solution could be and about how prohibitive the costing could be. But I think, I think Port Murray as the capital, um, again, we will have to do more in terms of advocating for the necessary engineering work to be done because it's not as easy as bringing in a few engineers again it's it, in this country if you're looking to draw uh, a crosswalk gary garfield if you're looking to draw a crosswalk you're going to need approval from the police and perhaps the parish council and all kinds of entities so it's not something as simple as just bringing in some engineers mm -hmm. um it is something that will have to be a part of a bigger plan for the development of Port Maria. And I think Port Maria is such a beautiful space. It's ripe for development in tourism, in agriculture, and in agriculture tourism. It's a kind of town that we can't, it's a kind of, and I see somebody saying roads, water, electricity, I agree. And that is the, the, the normal course of things that you will advocate for. But I think the kind of development that we have to do for tourism in Port Maria has to be a little bit different from some of the developments we have seen on the coast. Um, I want to bring to your attention again the port and the Portland model. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. Poche, um, Negril, Montego Bay tends to attract a lot of North American tourists who are comfortable going behind a wall and just enjoying the facilities there. Portland tends to attract a lot of the European tourists. They will backpack. They will stay in a place like this guy who call, calls himself Chucky Freestyle and build up some places out of plyboard, charging people 30 US dollars per night to stay <laughs> in and providing them whatever he chooses to eat in the morning. And there, <laughs> you know, he's booked, he's booked for months. And you can check him out on YouTube. Um, right. Some of those 26% of visitors who to Jamaica last year stayed in Airbnb. And it is a growing space, especially as the, the cost of hotels hotel rooms Excuse continues me. to increase. Mm -hmm. um, what I intend to do is to work with the residents of Port Murray in places like even Manchester Lane that doesn't have, that is more a staircase that brings you there from um, Cox Street. And in places like Wentworth, where when you wake up in the morning and you see that view, you feel like you're the king of the earth. I intend to work with people like them and see how we can bring those kind of developments to them, help them to help themselves, but doing the necessary support that a facilitatory leader will need to do so that they can, they can work with me to find solutions within their communities. In terms of the engineering that the Port Mary will need to prevent the, every, the flooding, the major flooding every few years, that has to be a part of the advocacy agenda. Um, and I intend, to, I intend to stay on that as the Member of Parliament for Central St. Mary. All right. Uh, Omar, I don't know if you can see the comments. A few, not all. Okay. I do, uh, there's one there from uh, Chris Martin, Dahlia Chris Martin. I don't know. It says, and I think polit politicians get a bad name like this, but I wonder if you can respond to it. It says, and I quote, your agenda is indeed robust. I'm thinking you have good intentions. But from my experience, all potential politicians make all these promises. How do you respond to something like that? Well, the, the first thing I will say is I, I I understand where that view comes from. 
I'm a part of a generation where nobody can come to me and just tell me what you plan to do um, in order to get our vote. You must demonstrate what you are doing and what you have been doing, which is why I touched on some of those. A lot of the things I have touched on are things that can be done. And if you note, I've separated my program, my programmatic agenda from my advocacy agenda. The things that I will advocate for are not things that I can come in and tell you that it will be done tomorrow. Those are issues that I will be bringing to the, to the, to the parliament. Um, I will be raising and, uh, and speaking on at every opportunity on behalf of the people of Central St. Mary. Those are the advocacy matters. Things such as going into um, Wentworth and convincing the community that they can, in a relatively inexpensive way, be a part of the tourist dollar earning economy. Those are conversations that have already started. Those are things that really just going in as a leader, building on the, the, the foundation that those who have come before you have already built, but going in with a different view on things. Those are, those are things that require just a conversation, a follow through, um, perhaps reaching out with, to others to help to get some building materials to see how you can build and get into that space. And once you do one or two and other people realize that it's something that really can be done, then people will buy in and they will do it. I'm going to be there beside them as their leader. I'm not promising that I'm going to come and turn water into wine and change everything, but I've started putting in the solar streetlights and I intend to dedicate a part of my constituency development fund to accelerating that program. I've started working on play fields. I've demonstrated how I will partner with the private sector um, to employ a model that is not a new model, but is a new model to Jamaica to see how we can collaborate to get that done. Um, so I'm pretty confident in the agenda and the, the, uh, the things that I've put forward as things that I will do. I'm pretty confident that these are things that are within reach and will, I will get done. All right. Daily, uh, daily, I hope that satisfies you. But one, one more thing, though, Garfield, yeah. because I might Go ahead, not man. get another chance to speak on it. <laughs> um, I think there's a, there's a major shortage of green spaces within the constituency that people can just go out to and chill. And I think green spaces are essential to the mental health um, of our residents. I went to visit a fish farm in Ola Arba, and by chance, I stopped. In Ola, by, by chance, I stopped at a play field that has a, you know, a nice little bench area and um, an ice cream parlor and you know those things. But Garfield, you live in the US, and I don't know if you visit New York. I have not spent a lot of time in Florida. Yeah, One of the there. things I've always liked in New York is the outdoor exercise space. So in Jamaica, we don't have a lot of spaces for children to go and develop their finer muscles where they can climb up a monkey bar and slide <laughs> down a slide and really be kids and enjoy themselves. I want to see how I can work with the agenda. So when I speak about health and wellness, it's not just about corrective care. It's also about preventative care to see how we can bring some people from the diaspora to provide some materials and bring some welders who are prepared to volunteer their time. And some of the parts that are already there that we're focusing on only fixing up good for netball and football to see how we can fix up those so that your your three-year-old and five-year-old and seven-year-old can also come out and just be children and enjoy themselves and mothers can come out with them and just you know enjoy a sunday evening um one way i think we can do that if we have a little concession stand where we tell the operator that look your responsibility is to maintain the restroom um mm -hmm. and to keep the grass low and that is the rent you will pay, you know, just throwing an idea out. All that right. is one way I feel we can maintain a space. Because when I was at this park in Old Arbor on a Sunday, there's a good, there was good traffic of people just going there with their children, having ice cream, sitting on the benches mm -hmm. and enjoying themselves. We need a similar park. The, the, the goal must be to get one into every community. But I think we should start with at least one in every division. In every division. All right, I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit now. Please, <laughs> please. All right, uh, you seem to be able to wanna bring a new 
how should I say, new thought, new ideas into this whole political realm. Copying places like European countries and the US. How can we change the mentality of the Jamaican electorate who are always there with their hand out? What do you, as an aspiring MP, see as the responsibility of government and the responsibility of her citizens? What should the government be responsible for on one hand, and what do you think the citizen should be responsible for on the other? Break it down for me. So, so the first thing I want to say, and apology, I, I know I keep drawing on examples from out of country, but the, the ward bosses in Chicago politics, for example, a lot of them over the years, their main responsibility was to ensure that the vote was secured by any means necessary. And a lot of times that was, um, you know, depending on the era of their politics, that was by buying votes. So True. Mm -hmm. in, ter in terms of the development of politics, by and large, they would have moved from a stage where they're doing that kind of vote buying on an open, um, in the open. And they have probably gone to a different space now where when mm -hmm. I was in Chicago and Obama became president, they tried to sell his Senate seat and that governor went to, went to prison. But, you know, there is all, there has been some of that in a lot of countries in terms of depending on the stage of their development that they have been. So I want to start off by saying that that is not unique to Jamaica. So that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. The second thing is in, in my household, one of the things I've learned and it's not bashing anybody because I think I've been able to appeal to both PNP, JLP and people who are um, generally not among the voting population. But I've always been told that the JLP always outspends the PNP in elections. But whenever we have gone to the electorate with an inspire, inspire, a message that is inspiring enough, we have been able to bring people in. What I intend to do is to go to, to my electorate in Central St. Mary with an inspirational message um, to show them how they can be involved and to break down to them how detrimental vote buying is. Because the truth is when someone comes and buys your vote, they have no further responsibility to you. But I want you to be my board of director as my electorate. And I want you to hold me accountable over the period of time um, that I am there serving. And I intend to keep in touch and to engage over that period of time um, to see how we can monitor the development of the constituency, go community by community, division by division, and ensure that the community is always behind the plan and that there is constant communication. I've seen Julian Robinson employ a similar approach in his constituency and it has worked it has worked tremendously for him and when you hear how his constituents speak of him and he's a relatively fresh member of parliament this would be fresh his MP, third yeah. term mm -hmm. this is his third term and that is the approach that he has brought and what i what i intend to do is to draw on the best practices from everybody um Dr. Guy has been my political mentor and one of the things I admire about him and it perhaps is because of his role as a, a country doctor. He knows everybody by name and when he talks to everybody it's as if um, you know they're the only person in, in the world. I intend to borrow that. Portia Simpson Miller has a similar style. In terms of Julian Robinson and how um, he is constantly engaged I intend to borrow that, um, you know, and to ensure that there is constant reporting and accountability across the constituency. And the people will tell you, I, I, I love the streets. I love being out there with the people. And they would have been seeing this. Those who don't remember it when I was younger, they would have been seeing it since 2011 when I was here campaigning. And since 2012 when I gave up lecturing at Monroe College to move back to Jamaica. And um, they would have seen that since then. Okay. Uh, and in the comments also, thank you, uh, Mr. Newell. But in the comments also, I have somebody saying, they're hearkening back to the days of Wycliffe Martin when he was MP. And they're saying that, hey, you mentioned before, we had we have the chocolate thing down in Richmond. We had... Listen, 
when I first came to Baileysville, that's, that's where I learned the term boxing plant. I never knew what a boxing plant was. The, but there were boxing plants for banana all over, every couple of miles. Yeah. We also had, Port Mar was one of the first places where banana was shipped from. After last week, I spoke to a few agricultural experts, and they were saying that from the studies they have done of St. Mary, one of the big problems is the rainfall pattern has changed, and they're almost convinced that agriculture in St. Mary will never be the same. What do you say to that? And I was talking to some real top guys in agriculture. What do you say so, about that? So the first thing I'll say is I agree that agriculture in St. Mary will never be the same. But I won't, in, in agreeing, I don't have the same cynical outlook that some may have when they say it will mm -hmm. not be the same. Um, by the way, just to put out, uh, you spoke of banana and boxing plant. I went by one of my supporters um, recently, which is Farmer Costas Bobby Pottinger, to sit and learn about the history of banana in St. Mary and how Albany was a major train stop. Um, that people mm -hmm. would, you know, take their banana from all over and it would sail down to, um, I think, Orokabesa. And that was a major port that banana mm -hmm. would sail from. And I learned some of that. And, you know, um, there's a place in Port Maria, a little bit out of Port Maria, a little, little bit area called Radical Farms. I think Radical Farms represents, uh, gives a glimpse of how agriculture can look in um, St. Mary. Radical Farms has uh, a greenhouse business. They do cherry tomatoes. Uh, is it cherry or grape tomatoes? They do those small tomatoes that are sold in supermarkets all across Jamaica, using probably uh, one-fifth of the space that some of the older farmers that you speak of would have thought necessary to grow that kind of thing. Everything is temp temperature controlled. Um, Hydroponics. Everything inside is sanitized and clean to prevent pests as a part of their pest control. Mm -hmm. And greenhouse technology is what they use. There are some cheaper um, ways of doing greenhousing than radical farms might currently employ because we have to lift both small farmers and large farmers if, mm -hmm. if we're going to go forward with agriculture. Um, but we will have to <coughs> employ technology if we're going to uh maintain output in terms of agriculture both greenhouses and um a, a, a friend introduced me to another technology when i was reading up on agriculture as a part of my plan called grow house a grow house is is kind of like a 40 foot or a 20 foot container where you pretty much lock in the things and you program in the nutrients and over time everything runs itself and yeah. then when when when, when when you're ready to harvest, that is when you would you would bring in your staff to harvest and to grade and to package. But the, the fisheries, inland fisheries, fisheries is also a part of agriculture that we would have we will have to pay attention to. And finally, in terms of agriculture, we will have to look at agrotourism as a way to increase um, our earnings. You know, when I was in college, I always laughed at the fact that I. I felt so excited being bamboozled to go on an apple farm and pay to pick apples. <laughs> the pay to pick apples pay to and strawberries. And, and, then, <laughs> and then pay to weigh and leave with apples. And, <laughs> you know, so, so we have to look at how we can add value to everything that we do now. Value added is really the way forward for, for every economic activity that we do. Any any plans of bringing in some investment like factories and all all these things? I remember growing up, we had that big Brazier plant in in at Trinity. But any yes. ideas of hey, we have an influx of so many Chinese? Yes, couldn't we have some of them instead of being selfish with their products, with their business? Can we have some of them come in and invest? Could you speak to any of them? So I think the primary role of government at this level mm -hmm. is to facilitate. Um, I have a number, during my time as president of the Patriots, I've built a significant, um, even though I, I don't have a physical Rolodex in 2023, mm. but my, my virtual Rolodex has a significant number of P 
people from Central St. Mary who call me regularly and who I call all the time and have um, conversations with and we discuss just how we can use the new road network, the, the, the relatively new highway network that would have been built down here that makes so much of the country open. Um, how we can bring them in, you know. I recently started a distribution company in Galena as well. We do some employment there. And we sell and distribute to as far as uh, Negril, St. Elizabeth, um, Portland, St. Thomas, from that space, and into Kingston. You know, one day, one, one day a friend of mine said, boy, I'm tired of seeing when he's going into Kingston, all the bread van and everything coming this direction around Junction. He wants to start seeing some trucks going the other way. Um, so absolutely, I, I think a part of my role will be to see how we can encourage investors to come in and to invest in St. Mary. But, you know, we'll have to do some work on the infrastructure. One of the things I will have to advocate for early, and I started with, interestingly, the, the, the brilliant young man you had on the other day named Byfield. He has a, uh, an, ICE, an internet service providing company, an ISP. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we had a discussion one time about how we could improve the ICT infrastructure in Port Maria. That is one of the things that we will have to do because we talk about the physical infrastructure, but if you don't have the virtual infrastructure, some of the, the, the quote-unquote new Brazier factory, such as a call center, not going to St. Mary as an option because they rely significantly on being able to interface with people um, out of town. But we have to raise, we have to relift the profile of the entire parish so people don't True. just see it as the, the one of the poorest parishes um, in Jamaica, but that they see it as a place for opportunity, um, as another frontier that they can come in. Um, in terms of the influx of Chinese, even though some of them have become good friends and supporters of mine. I fully agree with you. Um, not to name drop, but one of my supporters is Peter Paul. I was mentioning to him that when I was a little boy growing up in Highgate, I could look up to people like him and Bedward and others and say, well, you know, maybe I could go in business. A lot of people who look like me doing business. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mentioned to him just that very concern that you mentioned. Um, but it's a tight balance because our motto is still out of many one people. So we have True. to see how we um, create a society that provides opportunities for every Jamaican, regardless of where you're from, regardless of your yeah, background. Most, most people, I don't most think, people are I don't think that I don't think our, our history of picking winners has worked best for us. I think we have to look at how we can how we can um, create a society that people with ideas, because ideas is really what will bring currency. Um, some of the biggest assets in the world are not things that you can touch. True. Facebook, Facebook, perhaps the only things you can touch in uh, that Facebook has are their office equipment and their servers. But it is a major company. The same with Microsoft. There's a whole lot of wealth in um, in the orange economy, the creative space the space for ideas. And St. Mary has produced a whole lot of brilliant people with good ideas. So we also have to look at how we can bring venture capital in St. Mary so that when a man has an idea and yeah. the idea has merit, you can say, well, you can go and pitch to this person and see how they can invest. And we can stop the brain drain, right? And we can stop the But, yeah. Because <laughs> I and hear that as... Brain, and move to what I call brain circulation. Um, if, 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 Raymond, <laughs> if Raymond Price is watching, he would love the term. It's a term that I, I, I've I heard since. I didn't hear it before I had mentioned it to him on a New York tour when I still lived in the U.S. And it's the mm. idea that people, which is what I did somewhat, which is that people can leave, go abroad, get some different perspective and experiences having lived and studied, and come back and improve mm -hmm. their space. So I'm, I'm hoping we can move from brain drain, drain perhaps to brain circulation. All right. So, Ms. Daniel, if you were to be the chosen one, how uh, do you think you and uh, your opponent, Mr. Morris, do you think you could join hands and move the whole party together, move the whole constituency together? What, what I've said to my team, Garfield, 
from the moment I did my baseline pull and it demonstrated that I was ahead, I thought that that came with significant responsibility. So I told my mm -hmm. team that we have to run a positive campaign. And the reason we have to run a positive campaign um, more than anything else is because we will have the task when we win of bringing everybody together. Now, there's been no nothing that anyone can point to that shows that I've deviated from that. And so absolutely, I will be able to sit down with um, Senator Morris and to ensure that with a senator in Senator Morris and a member of parliament in Omar Newell, we can coordinate, <laughs> we can coordinate on that development plan um, for constituency and parish. I think Central St. Mary will be well served by my, my good friend who is very experienced in the Senate. He's been a senator um, since 1998. I finished fifth form in 1998. Um, he's been a senator for a good time. So he has a lot, a wealth of experience um, in the upper house. And I think that that will serve us well when I push legislation from the lower house or when he decides to originate any um, <laughs> in the upper house. I think Central St. Mary will be well served by having both of us. Right. And, and before your friend kick you to your house, somebody, somebody said I should ask you this evening, just like I ask my feel. Yes. You hear in politics, they talk about a youngster should wait his time, pay his dues, fall in line not jump over, not hopscotch. What do you think about that? Because there are others who think you should just wait until your turn. It's not your turn yet. Well, the truth is Portia Simpson Miller didn't wait. She became a vice president of the party at 34. Um, PJ Patterson didn't wait. He became a, a vice president at the par of the party at either 33 or 34. Um, Michael Manley did not wait. I think if you are competent enough, you are old enough. And that is the philosophy that I have lived my life by. Um, I'm not accustomed to being, I'm not unaccustomed to being the youngest in the room. I'm not mm -hmm. unaccustomed to being the David in the fight, but I'm very much accustomed to David prevailing. And so, um, it, you know, the, the people who believe that politics, uh, is an endeavor where you must skip generations and, um, allow, allow, you know, the, the, the older ones to go in and, and to legislate. I don't agree. That's not where the world is going. Um, you know, if you look across the world, I, I'm not, I think it's St. Kitts. I might be mistaken, but one of my classmates, I have a classmate who is a former leader of the opposition in Dominica, mm, okay. <laughs> a former leader of the opposition. I have a classmate who is the speaker of the house in St. Kitts and Nevis. And so this idea that in Jamaica, um, we must remain committed to a tradition that has not always served us well, that says you must wait your turn. I don't really give any credence to it. I think if you're competent enough, you're old enough. But what about the accusation that Omar is too brash, too bold, too cocky? How do you I, respond? Well, I, I haven't heard that a lot. The people who have <laughs> met me the people who have met me on the streets, um, the people who I've been meeting with in, I just saw Frontier, so let me just mention Frontier because Frontier is in the house. The people who I've met in Jacks River and Flint River, the people who I've met in uh, places far and wide within the constituency, whether it is in um, Islington, you know, there's a part of Richmond, I don't know if Miss Sadar is on this week. Um, <laughs> the people in Marlborough, uh, the people in Trimwell's work, the people in Highgate, once they have met and know me, they know that I am different from any picture that has been painted of me. And they understand fully the difference between confidence and arrogance. And they have been cheering me on as a youth, and they continue to cheer me on. In terms of, I, I've heard Obama say that it is difficult to be a leader without a little bit of arrogance because if someone steps forward and says there are 28,000 uh, people in Central St. Mary and I think I can lead it, that in itself might sound presumptuous. Um, but 
I, I have been grown, I've been raised up um, to be confident. You know, you could blame my mother for telling me that I can become anything that I want, even coming out of that one bedroom house in Fraserwood. Um, so that isn't a major narrative on the ground. A few people have come and have said that that narrative has been put out. But as soon as I turn up in a community and the people meet and find out how down to earth I am and just my approach, that has been pushed back very easily. And so if there are people on this live who would want that one-on-one, -on -one, I'm open. My telephone number, as I tell people all the time, is not a secret because I, the only thing I'll say regarding my telephone number is if you don't get me by phone, um, send me a WhatsApp because sometimes I use my phone to do things like this and I have to put it on airplane mode so you might call and not get me. Um, but my phone number is 876-388-1368. Um, that has been my number since 2012. It is the only phone number I use. And if I try to return as many missed calls as possible and I respond to every, I respond to every WhatsApp message. I get Everyone, hundreds eh? per day, but even, yeah. you know, the, the, a, a WhatsApp message, you can sit in the passenger seat of your vehicle and go through and respond. So I try my best to respond to as many as I can um, throughout the day. If I don't respond same day, I'll respond the following day when I get up um, in the five o'clock bells, when my, when my son jumps on my bed and says, Daddy, um, get up and play with me. I, I will play a little bit and then I go back through a few of those WhatsApp messages. So people find out that that is, that is a false narrative shortly after meeting me. All right. So are you saying then that anybody would be able to just approach you on the street? I think I put your number up on Please. the screen. Is that it? That is 876 That is my number. Good, and good. my email good. address is omar.newell at gmail.com. So I'm... I'm Omar. Easy to reach. Right. And if you can't <laughs> find me, go over Miss Murray in Islington and tell her you're trying to find her, her, her son <laughs> when politics. She's my auntie, but if you tell her her son, she'll be, she will know. And if you can't All find right. her, go up Lebanon and ask for Juni and tell Juni you're trying to find his brother. And if you can't find me there, go up Highgate and ask for pleasure. And tell them, <laughs> oh, tell them you're you trying are, to find me. You, you can't are find a riot. Me. You can't find me there, go down to Pope Murray and find Savannah. And tell her that you're trying to find me. If you can't find me there, go around back and and ask for Catherine. And tell her that you're trying to find Omar. And if you can't find me there, call Paul Fife, who is on my team. Oh, I'm God, this very is funny. Easy to find in this constituency. <laughs> All right, Mr. Newell, I, uh, thank you very much. Is there anything you'd like to close with? Is there anything that I should have asked you that I didn't that you'd like to put out there before we go? Um... Yes, you should, you should have asked me how I feel about St. Mary High meddling at champs this year. And what I want to close out with is just congratulations to Mrs. Sadar and the people of the students of St. Mary High School and the staff who worked so hard. I like to think I played a very small role and I will continue to play uh, my role there as needed. And, you know, I just want to encourage the people of Central St. Mary to um, vote wisely and vote for the future development. Listen to what the people are saying on the road. Um, if you're a delegate and you will have a say in the internal contest when it comes around. Mm -hmm. And just remember that the idea of being a delegate comes from the idea that people are delegating something to you. And mm -hmm. so I hope that you will be you, you will be a, a, an appropriate delegate for the sentiments of your community. And if you are, you will be saying it's time for Newell and it is time for New. And you will come on board with Team New, which will be the winning team. Thank you, Garfield, and thank you for everyone oh, who joined Omar, me. Omar, thank you. Thanks for coming, man. I know I put you in a tight spot when you had to jump on so quickly, but I really appreciate it. I but really Garfield, do. And, you remember, mm -hmm. you remember when, when you call like most interviewers who are as courteous as you and you ask if there is anything that is off limit, um, yep. what was my response? Yeah, you said there was nothing I could ask, any darn thing I wanted. <laughs> I'm, I'm an open yeah. book. Yeah, and you said I could go any, anywhere I wanted to. Who, who have questions and want to know more about Omar Newell. I'm your son. I'm your brother. I'm your, I'm your cousin. Give me a call. 
come learn more about me. And I will share, okay. I'll add it to my broadcast list so you can see some of the good work that Team Newell is currently doing in yeah, this you need to see this man's face. You need to see this man's Facebook page. In fact, uh, you seem to be taking a big step out there when it comes to this whole technology business. You embrace technology. You and Mr. Byfield seem to really, you know, make use of the tech. We are what you call digital natives. Um, okay. We, we, we grew up in a time when um, you pretty much, I had high five before I moved to the US. Facebook launched in 2005 mm -hmm. and um, it required a .edu email address. I had one, I jumped on it. And you know, we're digital natives. That is how we communicate. That is how we keep in touch with our classmates. But I think both myself and I'm not, I'm campaigning for me, but let me just mention uh, Giovanni as well. I think we both communicate as effectively in person in terms of the pressing flesh that politics requires. Um, mm -hmm. as we do in the digital space. And yes, um, I have a very strong team that ensures that wherever I fall off in terms of technology, um, mm -hmm. they have, you know, I'm, I, I recently, I have always had a TikTok account. I didn't realize how relevant TikTok is to politics. But when my, uh, my candidate manager puts out something on TikTok, you best believe about 11,000 people, many from Central St. Mary. Wow. are jumping on and when we go into a community for the first time they say i want to meet you because i saw you on tiktok or i saw you on facebook and i love what you're doing and sometimes i'll step back and i'll say you know even though it's not her you're voting for um this is the person who has been doing <laughs> a lot of that work brilliant okay person. and if anybody wants a good social media manager i'm encouraging her to go into that that line of business she's very brilliant and i have a solid team overall a good mix of um young and seasoned politicians everton garvey i want to shout out to him um he has managed campaigns in central st mary's the most senior vice chairman for the in the constituency he is my campaign manager you see i'm the only campaign campaigner in central st mary now in the internal election that can boast that my entire team my entire team is homegrown everybody on my team whether you're call my campaign director, my campaign manager, my road manager. They're all central St. Mary voters and residents. And that is right. because I've been able to command the respect of so many uh, people within the constituency from the business community and from the political community. And the final thing I want to do is, um, I don't know if he's watching, but I want to say good evening to my member of parliament. Um, he's one of them who encourages young people and I know he doesn't have a candidate in this race, um, but you know he has he has done a whole lot for young people going to um, tertiary studies in this constituency. Um, some of them are on my team, and I want to say big up to him on behalf of them, and on behalf of myself. Oh, Omar, thank you very much, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming. And we eagerly await the results of this election. Whoever wins it, I'm sure St. Mary will be a winner. And with when you two come together, I'm sure you'll be unstop unstoppable, regardless of who is the MP or not. All right? But I'll be coming back to you again, and I hope you'll be ready to come on again to give your victory speech. Right? Gladly. <laughs> we, we, we will see how we can patch you in on the live. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Omar, thank you very much, man. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it, my brother. Thank I appreciate you. it. Take care, man. Thank you, viewers. Ladies and gentlemen, we just heard from Mr. Omar Newell. Sounds like a very confident young man. Man, very eloquent. He can talk. He could sell ice to an Eskimo. <laughs> and I, he, he, he seems to have some good plans. And I hope the electorate when this thing is over, I hope the electorate will be able to galvanize behind the MP. And I hope you'll be able to push things through Parliament and through the Senate. For those who tuned in live tonight, I appreciate it. Thank you. For those who sent in the chat, great. Keep it up. So if you're going to watch this on the replay, please don't be afraid to comment. And ladies and gentlemen, have a great evening. Tomorrow, head out to church if you must. Peace out. 
Be good. Stay safe. This is Garfield Wallace signing out from Rock Mike.